Well, let's have some fun with our brains together. Okay, see if this sounds familiar. So, if you're working your job, you're living the dream, everything is laid out in front of you, life is good. And then, like I said, bam, a problem you see in the world just seems to drive the living daylights out of you. So what do you do? You check the internet, you look for a solution to your dilemma, and nothing seems to solve the problem, and it now has become a distraction. So what do you do? You talk to your friends, and they tell you it's simple. All you have to do is think outside the box. And of course, being the brilliant person you are, you stick this little memory in the back of your head, and you get back to work, and you think, someday I'll solve this innovative problem. Well, then all of a sudden, bam, it happens. You come up with probably what you think is the most important solution to this problem ever, and you think other people will want to hear about it too. Well, congratulations, you just had an aha moment, and that feels good. Well, now you want to share this idea with other people. And so what do you do? You package it up, you take it out, you show it to other people. But the crazy part about it is you get these confusing looks on everybody's face. You see, part one was easy, part two is hard. What makes it difficult for people to gather the new ideas? And sometimes we find ourselves saying, you know, you just got to take a look at my prototype and you'll see the idea if I show it to you. Or better yet, if you have an hour, let me go through my PowerPoint deck. Well, you know, part one was easy, part two was hard, because the words matter. You see, within words are encompassed the entire human experience we call meaning and meaning motivates humans. And within every meaning is a potential transaction that requires a decision. Do I want to experience this or do I not? And the key part about an experience is, is I'm not talking about exchanging money. I'm talking about before we transact in dollars, we actually transact in words. We transact in things that are valuable between each, each person. And so from that point on, we decide very early on that words are something that we can transact that gets other people's attention. So the key part that we try to figure out as we look at the box is that the origin of thinking outside the box actually had its start in 1914 it, when Sam Lloyd published what I think is probably one of the most fun books ever. It's entitled The Cyclopedia of 5,000 Puzzles, Tricks, and Conundrums with Answers. I don't think we use that word conundrum enough. And on page 301 of this grand book, you will find the, the origin of the original puzzle, which is not anything to do about a box at all. As a matter of fact, when Sam wrote this puzzle, it was about eggs. And what you're supposed to do is you take an arrangement of three by three eggs, and the instructions actually tell you to draw a line through the center of the eggs to try to connect as many of them as you can in a single stroke. Now, on page 301 of that book, he shows the answer in six lines. Now, there's also a series of solutions that you can do with five lines, and you still feel pretty good about yourself in accomplishing that. The key part about it is, is that you probably have seen somewhere along the line in your training and your education this famous nine-dot problem. And while you were asked to think about it, you were spending about 10 minutes looking at these dots, and you were asked to actually solve this problem in four lines. And while you were struggling with it, someone probably told you that the orientation of these dots actually form in your unconscious mind a square that inhibits you from thinking of a different solution. Now, of course, you hear that answer, and of course, the problem doesn't become any easier because you still have to figure out which way to put the lines in the dots. Now, the key part about this is I wish the gurus in the 1970s and 80s that adapted this product and actually brought it to all the training world would have literally spent more time reading the first part of, of Sam Lloyd's book where he actually has another problem on the exact same page, which could arguably be called an inside-the-box problem. You see, now in this particular problem, the dots, or eggs, as they are in this particular example, your job is to arrange them as the best you can in the greatest number of rows of three in a line. Well, if you take nine objects and have them three in a row, you think, well, there's vertical rows, there's the horizontal rows, and then there's the diagonal rows, and you've got it all figured out. Well, I don't want to spoil the problem for you. I'd like to have you work on it on your own, but you'll recognize if you look at it a different way, it actually has a different solution. So in the fairness of the times, I really wish that they'd have brought both the inside the box and the outside the box problem, because we wouldn't have had to have that big discussion of which one was right and which one was wrong. 
You see, my own personal opinion is that the, actually the gurus, when they were actually reading these problems, couldn't run through the first problem in the outside the box, went to the back of the book on page 380 to look at the answer like most of us would do, right? And then when they figured out that there was a square there that inhibited them from creating the answer, they figured out that that was the answer to their problem as well as every other struggle that was in their life. So they brought that forward emotionally. I think the big thing that we find here is, what do we learn from the puzzle maker? Well, Sam, in the preface to his book, actually says that he treats puzzles as a way to sharpen the mind and to train the wits and to train your brain to actually look between the lines to whenever you solve a problem. Now, that's very fascinating because as you look at this particular problem, the lines are not the thing that get in the way, it's the dots. Well, way back in 1969, a series of researchers from the University of Texas actually asked students to do the exact same problem. And they actually told them that they could look past the dots in order to solve the problem. Turns out, when you tell someone they can actually look past the dots and extend their lines, it only marginally increases the number of people who can actually solve the problem. It turns out, the results of their findings, that it isn't your perception of that square that's the, actually the problem. It's the fact that the series and the sequence of the lines that solve the problem are non-obvious to you. You see, the point is that it's not obviousness. Now, that's interesting because that's the actual point of a puzzle, to be non-obvious. You see, Sam Lloyd wrote the puzzle so that only one out of 100 people could get it right. But you see, you and I, when we have those aha moments, when something was previously non-obvious and now it's obvious, our job is to actually make things obvious and make them sticky. I've actually repeated this research with this box with hundreds and hundreds of students, and it turns out the fascinating part about it is today, this problem is widely seen. I'm sure many of you have actually tried to do this problem. The key part of it is, is that when they sit down to do it again, the funny part is they remember the box, they remember the problem, they remember that there's something about the box that makes the problem hard, but they can't remember the solution even though they told us beforehand they knew how to do the problem. So the key part is, why is the box sticky, but the solution is not? What is it about our brain that keeps us from understanding what is sticky and what is obvious, and how do we process through that? Well, let's now take and reimagine the box, if you will, and change it from a motivational mantra into something very useful. You see, the world comes at us in a series of perceptual frames. From moment to moment to moment, while you've been sitting here today at this conference, you've been absorbing and viewing everything through all of your sensory inputs. If we actually take the box and turn it into a frame by which we perceive the world from moment to moment, it actually turns out that as we look at these moments, we update them from things we already know in our memory. And since the creative process is also a thinking process, it's important to recognize that your creative processes also run through your memory. Now, the cool part about the box is we now can take those frames and understand how we look at the world and what we do next. So the key part is, as we've re-looked at how this works, what do you suppose is the most important thing that gets in the way of your creative moments? Well, it actually turns out that it is your memory. Let's take a look and see how, that, in fact, that happens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a series of fun puzzles for you to play with and see how well your mind actually processes what you see. And from that, we'll see if we can figure out how to turn something that's non-obvious into obviousness and what you can do to practice every day to have more aha moments. So the first one I'm going to show you is a very simple puzzle. All I want you to do is to fill in the blank. Are you ready to go? Here it is. A, B, C, D. Of course, you did very well. Now, what you did in that moment is you scanned that frame, you looked at the screen, and you said A, B, C, and you memorized the answer as D. Because how do you know the answer is D? It's strictly a memorized response. Now, it's interesting. I know some people will actually go, well, he's a creative guy, so is it D? They answer it like as if it's a question. And of course, the thing that's interesting is there is one right answer in your mind, but there are also 22 non-obvious answers that are also work. I have really wonder why no one ever says the letters M, the letters S, the letters T, because all of those actually solve the problem but you're thinking it has to be in a right order. Of course, there is always the Jackson 5 answer, A, B, C, 
one, two, three. See, once I said Jackson, you knew what the answer to the question was already. Now, it's interesting, whenever we see a question, we get so much anxiety over what's the one answer, when in fact there are so many other answers that are probable, we wouldn't have to have any anxiety at all. You see, that's the fun part about the creative process. When you turn the non-obvious into the obvious, you give yourself more choices. All of a sudden, this very simple problem goes from one answer to 22 possible answers. As long as you didn't say A, B, or C, you would have been right. Now, the next one I'm going to show you is a little bit more challenging of a puzzle because it requires you to understand a cipher. Now, deciphering is where you get a word scramble. There will be a set, of, a set of letters that I'm going to show you. And what I want you to try to figure out is what does this say? Are you ready to play? Let's see what you come up with. What does this say? Well, it's interesting. What's happening right now is your brain is scanning all the letters. And because you heard my name is Jeffrey Stamp, you think maybe the JS has something to do with me. But no, you take a further look at the letters and you think, well, maybe that last set of four letters, the C could be a G, the Q could be an O, and you start to get a felt sense about what this phrase starts to say. And usually in a room of about 100 people, I'll get that one person that'll say, I think it says ice cream is good. And then I'll ask them, how do you know? They go, well, I think if you just sit back and look at it long enough, kind of like a magic picture, you'll say, if I look at it long enough, it seems to say, I don't know, the letter score is right, three, five, two, four. Maybe I can see it as ice cream is good. But the key part here to recognize is until we can teach everyone in the room to instantly have that aha moment, it still is not obvious to most of us. So how do we do this? What we need is we need an algorithm for our brain to convert the unknown to the known. See if you can work it this way. Start with, can you find the equator on every one of those letters? Find the equator on every one of those letters. Second of all, draw a line through the equator that links all those letters. Then read only the top part of the letters. Now what does it say? Aha, yeah, ice cream is good. Now, the key part is we used an algorithm to illuminate what was previously non-obvious. You see, for puzzle makers like Sam Lloyd, this is the big aha for them. But think about it, when you come up with something brilliant at work or in your career and you want to share it with others, what was previously non-obvious to you still is confusing to someone else. So we have to have a better way in order to process it so you know what to do with it. Now, if my method works, I can show you another cipher. Now, I generate dozens of these as I do puzzle work myself, and I share them with readers. And what's interesting is, if the algorithm works, you should be all able to get it instantly if I show you the next one. You want to play? OK. Let's see if you can get the next one right. What does this one say? Again, use the system. Find the equator. Draw a line through the center. I know some people have got their, their finger up and they're, they're looking at it. They're like, oh, how does that work, right? What's it say? You can read it. Wow, everybody now can see it because if you know what turns the non-obvious into the obvious, it becomes just that. It becomes obvious. You see, the fun part about this exercise is in a very short series of three steps, this concept. Here's a series of letters that I have to figure out and interpret how will I know what they say? The key part is this concept doesn't really enc encompass the idea. It just encompasses the new frame that you've put into your memory. Now, every time you see this group of scrambled letters, you would actually run through the memory. Step one, step two, step three. It no longer is a guessing game of trying to reimagine it because you took something that was unfamiliar and you made it familiar. This concept actually has an ability, but this is a really important part of the creative concept and the creative process. And it's not so much about when we get most problems, we try to make sense out of them. We use sense-making skills. That's what we learn in school. Now what I'm asking you to learn is a very rarely ever exercised part of your brain, and that's the part where we give sense to something, sense-giving. And it works very simply like this. Here's how the insight engine works in your brain. First, there's three steps. The first was to establish a context. Then we had to build a connection, and then we had to understand its consequence. Now, generally, there's a non-obvious way to use even just this very simple formula. 
And that is, what's the context? And the context was, well, there are a bunch of letters, I can't read them. So the context is, I can't just read them from left to right like I normally do. The new context is, I can only read the top half of the letter. Then let's just jump to step number three. What's the consequence? If I can read now above the letters, and the consequence is I can understand the words, then the connection must mean if I draw a line, that becomes the new reality. You see, the funny part about the nine dot problem is, when they tell you it's the square, you're focused on the dots. You're actually focused on the wrong context. The question is, can you put four lines through all the dots? The actual answer is it's about the lines. And you can use this exact same three-step process to sort out that problem. As a matter of fact, we find in the creative process, simply understanding how to switch a context is one of the most important aspects of what it takes to actually take something that didn't seem obvious and see it in a whole new light. Now, what can you do to practice in a new way that allows you to see something that you didn't see before? Well, you have to practice giving sense to something new. Here's one of my favorite activities to do with not only my students, but I also use it with all of my clients. And it's called a creative word hack. And it's really a lot of fun because the English language has a very malleable DNA. Words like automobile and television, and even my hometown, Minneapolis, are words that were invented to give new meaning. So what do we do? We invent brand new words in the English language. And it's really quite simple. Again, you follow the algorithm and it's a lot of fun. The first thing you do is you grab a newspaper or anything, a book, or any place where you can find some real juicy multiple syllable words. It's really important that you find a bunch of juicy words. And it's fun because you just spend 10 minutes doing this. It doesn't take a lot of time. So you find some really interesting juicy words. And the next thing you do is you dissect those juicy, those juicy words by separating them down their syllable splits. And then once you've got the words separated by their syllables, all you have to do is select a couple of them at random or not. If your eye just likes to find the words, then you just bring them out. And then what you do is you actually take the syllables apart and you reimagine them as brand new words. When I was working with a series of professors at the University of Tampa, one of my favorite words emerged from this exercise. And literally, in the same amount of time that we're talking right here, the professor took the two words, emergency and beverage, split them up, took them apart, and slammed them together and created bevmergency. Now here's the fun part. You hear this word, bevmergency. You've never heard this word before. Your brain instantly goes to the frame, goes to the back of your memory and goes, what does that mean? And then you search through all your hard drive to find all words that start with B. And then you're thinking, I really don't know what that is. But see, here's the best part about being the inventor. You get to establish the meaning of this word. And if it's sticky, it will transfer to everyone equally very rapidly. Here's the definition that was given to this word. A bevmergency is a meeting that's so boring that only an adult beverage can make the situation tolerable. See now, you understand it now that it's been explained to you, and because it's this new meaning, you're now going to memorize it. And because you've memorized it, now the next time you're having a boring meeting, you're gonna look at your friend and go, that was here with you today, they're going, yeah, this is a real emergency. We gotta get out of here. <laughs> the cool part about it is, is this takes a few minutes every day, but you exercise one of the most important brain functions, and that is how to let go of what I have already imprinted in my memory, and how do I process forward to give obviousness to something that just a second ago was unobvious? And this really works quite well. Here's a few words that I just love to share of my students that have created some of these words. Some of these words are really great. Given that it's an election year, I thought I'd share this one. A knuckleodian, a politician that says the same things over and over again so many times that it becomes annoying. We have dangers of that, right? How about these two words, saliva and explosive? A word called salivosive, a word, a food that is so desirable, it causes you to drool excessively at just the mere thought of it. Or a newsiverse, a newsiverse, a newsiverse is news that creates its own universe. Regurgiversity, oh boy, this one came right out loud and clear. A professor who teaches the same things over and over again each semester. Yes, that happens sometimes. This is one of my favorite corporate words. This came out during a corporate session, demachieving. Someone who only gets half their work done but always gets full credit in the eyes of their boss or teacher. We know that person who's dem achieving in our work, right? 
or embryomatic. Embryomatic is someone who at the first sign of sickness calls an ambulance as their primary care provider. Interesting, this word got very sticky. It ended up in the local newspaper because this actually is a major challenge in the healthcare industry. This was actually created in a session trying to understand how people react to the world around them. One of my favorite words that came up in one of our internal uh, sessions at our work is for all our employees love this word. It's called a funversary. Share this with your bosses at work. This is that new holiday where you get to specify a declared personal holiday where you get to do whatever you want. You get to pick that one day that's your funversary. For a lot of you, that's probably every day. But the key part is it became really distinctive. It got sticky, and we actually use it around the office all the time. When's your funversary? It becomes something of language and common. And of course, now one of my favorite ones that just came up last week in a session at a university called holopeditive. Holopeditive is that person in your family who always makes every holiday a personal competition. <laughs> now, you probably know who that person is. You can identify them. You can see them in your mind. But just a minute ago, you'd never heard the word holopeditive. Now it's a word that sticks in your head. So whether you're inventing a cure for one of the world's biggest challenges or you're simply trying to exercise your natural ability to give sense, you will have a process where the job to do is to change the context, understand what its consequence is through its meaning, and then redevelop a connection that helps turn the non-obvious into obvious. So what do we learn from the puzzle maker? It turns out that the world is just brimming with all kinds of conversations. They're all around us. There's all kinds of things being talked about, problems of the world, opportunities, everything that you want to imagine. But you see, all the opportunities to change the world that you need to change the world are only non-obvious at this moment. But like a puzzle, they don't need to stay that way. You see, the key to being creative isn't about how much you know. It's about how much you're willing to forget in order to make a new connection. And the role of your memory in the creative process is absolutely very critical. So please, use the frames in your box. Actually practice the process of sense giving. Be the creative person, but remember, awareness is assembled. It doesn't just happen in the flash of insight. It's something that you build and something that you practice. So the key thing as you walk and as you listen, as you hear, as you look at all the different opportunities in the world, remember the ideas that you create cannot change the world until they've assembled enough value to change the current conversation that is around you. So stay bold, be curious everyone, the planet needs you that way. Thank you very much.